Fair League 112, this is your guide for um, week number two in legal research. For week number two is your pre-class assignment. What I had asked you to do is um, start to become familiar with the Illinois courts. We will spend the greater deal of our time with Illinois courts and Illinois case law and Illinois statutes. We will dabble with the federal courts and, and you will be expected to know some things about the federal courts, but it's very important for what we do that you get to understand geographic jurisdiction um, and especially as it relates to the Illinois courts. So for your pre-assignment, I had asked you to explore the court's official website. And I don't give you a lot of direction there because it's 2021 and you know Google will help you find the site, but then you also need to locate maps. You need to start thinking in terms of geography. Case law in Illinois is not that difficult to track because there are only six possibilities. Trial courts do not publish their cases, do not publish their decisions. So you're looking at either decisions from the Illinois Supreme Court, which would be at the top of that hierarchy we talked about last week, or one of the five appellate court districts that we also introduced last week. And then I talked a little bit, as I recall, about how, you know, Peoria, if you live on the Peoria side of the river in Peoria County, you're in the 10th Judicial Circuit, which is in the third appellate court district. If you live in Germantown Hills or Metamora in Woodford County, or anywhere in Woodford County, you are in the um, ninth circuit. I take that back. You're in the 11th circuit and the uh, 4th appellate district. So geographically, you're actually a little north of parts of Peoria, right? But that's the way it's mapped out. If you're in Tazewell County, if you're in Peak in East Peoria, um, some of like Sunnyland, that area, or Creve Coeur, Marquette Heights, that's Tazewell County, Morton, Tazewell County. Tazewell County is in the 10th Judicial Circuit with Peoria, so it's also in the third appellate district. You don't have to memorize these in the next few weeks, but you should have them fairly well down in the next couple weeks, the next uh, five or six weeks, I guess. By the end of the semester, you definitely should have those appellate court districts down generally. For most of you, you're gonna work within two appellate court districts. Probably not gonna deal with the first district much unless you move to Chicago um, or the second district unless, unless you move north of I-80. You probably won't deal with the fifth district unless you move um, you know, south of, of Springfield, far south of Springfield. It's something you need to be familiar with. So I gave you some exercises there that also help you understand how many circuits we have as well. Um, you know, we have, you, as I identified last week, Peoria is in a five county circuit. Most circuits are multiple counties unless you get, until you get up by the Chicago area where the population is higher. Um, so that's the first part of your assignment. It's really nothing I can talk about. I can talk about it over and over again, like I did last week and just go through, you know, what the different court names are and the importance of jurisdiction, but it's something you have to experience. And so you need to take some time to do that. Um, the other thing that I'm asking you to become familiar with, and this is also something that you don't have to master by the third week, but you're going to have to master it soon in the sense that you need to rely on these resources and you need to commit to the fact that we do have to cite things properly, and that's legal citations. Um, and I gave you some exercises there as your pre-assignment. Um, now, the legal citations, you can buy books as guides, and we sometimes have had you buy books, but uh, Cornell has a really great online resource. You can download the book, you can print the book, you can do whatever you want with it. There's an actual book. You can save it as a PDF file to your computer. You can save the link and always go back there, but you need to look at that resource. And on Blackboard, there is a document 
titled ICC Paralegal Legal Citation Resources. And that's a kind of a compilation of things. Um, it starts off with some expectations for citations, general introduction to citations. Then it introduces the Cornell resource from Professor Peter Martin, um, which is a free and very useful resource. There's a link to the actual site where all the resources are located. And then there's a link to the book, which he calls the Indigo book. Um, and, uh, you know, ask me sometime, I'll explain that, but I won't waste your time right now why it's a color. But one of the good things on there, one of the things I ask you to review is to go to that, corn, that first link, the Cornell link, and to look at his description of legal citations and an introduction to it, but then also there are three videos. And the three videos, I ask you to take the time to watch. Now they're combined, they're a little over 30 minutes. So it's something that you have the time to do. I'm not gonna take a whole lot of your time on this discussion. Um, the rest of that document is, a, a, doc, a former document that we called Basic Legal Citation Guidelines. That actually started to come together when uh, Judge Mike Brandt, now retired, uh, was teaching legal research too, I believe. Um, he might have taught one as well, I don't know, it was a while ago. But Mike is a friend and, and um, he started a draft of this and then I took off with it. And then between our efforts, you know, it's just, a, it, it's a guide, okay? It's not something that's gonna allow you to master this skill. And again, citations is a skill and a process. Um, there is a, a reason that we cite, and it's maybe a different reason, slightly different than what other people do or use citations for in other careers or industries, or even in your English composition courses. But it breaks down about every type of resource with an example. It's not the end all be all, it's a shorter version and it's, it's a guide. When you have questions, go to the Indigo book, go to the full citator and go to that resource. I mean, by the time you get here, the idea is that you are familiar with plagiarism. You've had that, you know, given to you in the context of your courses, your other courses, uh, in the context of, you know, especially English composition courses since probably grade school. Yes, we cite things because we don't want to plagiarize, but we actually cite things in the law for a more practical reason. Everything that I cite in the law is going to be looked at probably gone to find and then reviewed or researched again by somebody else. It's going to be at a minimum relied upon by somebody else who may want to go and look at that source. And then if we have something that's in court, there's going to be a record of it. If I present a motion in the trial court of Peoria County, I want to appeal um, you know, that part of the case at some point, if I have incorrect or improper citations or worse, I miscited the law, I gave the wrong law and the wrong citation, intentionally or negligently, bad things can happen to me. All those bad things we started to introduce last week, including malpractice, not good. I cite things in the law, legal citations, so that someone else can find those things. So if you're doing a, a memo for me, a research memo, and I'm your supervising attorney, and for the purposes of this class, consider me and start acting like I'm your supervising attorney. You work for me. I'm paying you in a grade, let's say, if that helps you out, but come at it with that attitude. So I give you a, an assignment as your boss. If you wanna give me the accurate law, and you want to give me the accurate citation because you know what's going to happen? You're going to give me the document, you send it to me on my email or whatever. I'm going to open it and I'm going to go find that resource at some time. I'm going to go to that statute or case and read it myself. 
If it's something that we send to someone else, that would either be a client, opposing counsel, or the courts. Now, the clients might not always check your citations or check your accuracy of the law, and they don't. They come to us because they aren't legal experts. But if you do that improperly, that's something they can hold on to and raise at another time. We don't want that to happen. My opposing counsel, the, the other lawyer on the other side of the case, is going to review and test and look at the authority I say is the authority of why I'm basing my position or what I'm basing my position on. So is the court. Um, I've been in circumstances where I can't say that I, um, well, maybe. I can't say for sure, I guess, that, that I was ever in a circumstance where a lawyer intentionally misrepresented the law. I was in circumstances where um, I was a witness to a lawyer who miscited the law, did not have the proper or correct citations. It's embarrassing. Um, and eventually we're gonna get to uh, uh, Shepherds and validating, and we talked a little bit about that last week, but making sure that that authority that you present is not only cited correctly, but it's still good law. Um, it's still good. Now, that I'll have a good example for you because um, I had to be involved in a case where uh, my opponent, who was actually a lawyer who I was suing for legal malpractice, um, had a lawyer in this case and his lawyer made a big mistake in legal research uh, as far as validating cases, which cost his lawyer client. Both those guys ended up with ARDC cases, one of them disbarred, so it wasn't pretty. But um, we'll get to that at another time. But we cite to give the other side essentially, or to give someone else a map to the authority that we're providing, a way for them to go and find it easily. Um, and yes, we want to validate it and we want to make sure that we, you know, we, we uh, represent that it is an actual case or an actual statute, but it's a little different than how you cite or why you cite things in your English composition papers. Uh, this is a map. And I, I guess, you know, my good friends who teach those courses would say that that is a map as well. Um, but in our case, for sure, it's a map that somebody's going to use as a map. If you give me that document, I want to look up that case. I'm going to the citation. That's what I need to find it. Um, unless I want to redo the research all over again. And if I have to do that, I'm not going to appreciate it. And, you know, we get to the ethics discussion. We talk a little bit about the golden rule. Uh, in litigation and family law, I'll talk about the golden rule. Treat other people how you'd like to be treated. Provide a good, accurate citation. It's a golden rule kind of thing. Again, go to uh, Peter Martin's resources as provided on that guide. Read the basic legal citation guidelines, but then a lot of it won't make sense to you now. But when you go and do the follow-up exercises after we meet on uh, Monday, you will have probably a better idea. And you can go back to that. And again, it's a guide. It's, it's an example with some explanations and they're brief explanations. If it's not enough, what you're looking for, it gives you some key words. For instance, citation sentence or citation clause, which you can then go to um, the, the other guide on Cornell site and use those resources to kind of get a better idea or more detail about what you want. Um, we will get into those things uh, in greater detail. And then for sure, you're gonna get into some of those things like pinpoint citations in much greater detail when you have legal research too after this course is concluded. Those are the topics for this week. Um, and those are the two pre-class assignments. Um, and then after we meet and, you know, I get your questions and we have clarifications on Tuesday night, uh, you'll see on Blackboard that there's 
a follow-up assignment. Now, I'm not going to talk about that follow-up assignment now, and I'm not going to talk about that follow-up assignment in class. It's going to be something that, based on the effort and the things that I've asked you to do so far, far you're building up to. And those of you who have done those things and put in the time will be there. Those of you who haven't will have to go back and do some extra follow-up work. But again, you know, it's that bike ride. It's that getting your skill, your balance, your strength. No way around it. You got to do it. So there'll be this follow-up exercise and then we follow the same pattern. And that's how we're going to do it hereafter. That follow-up exercise is due Friday at noon of week two. Don't open anybody else's until after that deadline. And then you go and do a self-assessment and the outline of how to do the self-assessments on Blackboard. Um, and then be sure that you go back and you read um, or be prepared for the next pre-class assignment, because for week three, there will be a pre-class assignment that'll be posted by Friday, Thursday, Friday, depending on when I can get it up uh, and on the Blackboard. That's my week two guide. Um, again, to stress, this is like learning to ride the bike. I'm gonna guess that very few of you hopped on the bike and started pedaling the first time. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some patience. But if you put in the time and effort now, this is the second week coming up. By the fourth week, you'll be light years from the first week. By the eighth week, you won't even remember how much you struggled in these weeks. And by the end of the semester, you'll be ready to go to research too. Some of you will be taking that to an internship and maybe um, employment because I've had people that have taken it to employment before they've gotten to research too. But it depends on what you put into it now. And there's no shortcut. Absolutely no shortcut. There's no hack. That's the, I've been watching a lot of videos on YouTube about different things. Um, impact theory is the one dude I've been watching. I was talking about hacks, way to hack things, hack your mind, hack your body fat, hack your workout, hack this, hack that. Ain't no hack here. There's no hack. There are things that are much easier. Having Google as a secondary source would have been wonderful in the 1980s. I would have loved it. Having everything available on the computer, in some ways, much better. I got to tell you, though, when I pulled the books and then I had the cases all lined up on a table, I knew where they were. When I do it now, you know, electronically, sometimes I have a harder time keeping track of all my resources than I did back in the day. But still a lot quicker and easier. But the process is still the same. And if you don't follow the steps of the process, if you don't think in those terms of like geographic jurisdiction, if you don't go and check your citations every single time, Something's going to happen and it won't be something good. So put in the time and effort. Stay well. I'll see you Thursday.